video somewhat relates to the previous one I made on the Seven Wonders of the Ancient World. Again, it connects with history, and um, just a point, I don't intend this to be a very comprehensive video. If it was comprehensive, I would have to make days of footage to go through all the issues here, so I'm trying to be concise. Um, there's a video online, and it's it's about two or three years old now, but it's one of the most powerful videos I've, frankly, ever seen on YouTube. I think it's very effective at what it does, and yet very simple. So basically in the video, it's it's a pictorial history, and I'm hoping the sound quality is okay on this. It's a pictorial history of the Holy Land, basically, the ancient Near East and the modern Near East and the seemingly irretractable problems that region faces with seemingly never-ending conflict. So this video is about three minutes long and it goes along the soundtrack of Andy Williams' God Gave This Land to Me, which I assume was made in the 50s. And uh, it's entirely animated and it starts off with uh, a guy who's essentially a caveman or an Iron Age, um, Bronze Age settler. Uh, someone uh, quite helpfully below has put a list of what they believe all these different groups are. So let's say the caveman is basically singing Andy Williams song, God gave this land to me. And then seconds later, a Canaanite appears and shoots an arrow through him. And absolutely no interruption in the soundtrack. The song just continues, except this time it's a Canaanite singing it. A few seconds later... An ancient Egyptian appears, shoots an arrow through the Canaanite. And it goes on like this for three minutes, and it goes through the Assyrians, the ancient kingdom of Israel, the Babylonians, the ancient Greeks, the Macedonians, the Ptolemaic Egyptians, Alexander the Great's generals, Israeli Maccabees, the ancient Romans, the Byzantines, the Arab Omeyyads, the Christian Crusaders, the Mamluk Caliphate, the Ottoman Turks, the Bedouin Arabs, the British Empire, quasi-Palestinian Arabs, Israeli nationalist resistance against the British, the Arab coalition in the Six-Day War, modern Israel, Palestinians, and Gazans. And then death. It's this big, literally, the Grim Reaper hanging over everyone and all these thing, nuclear bombs in the background. It is very simple and yet very effective. And to me, that video says arguably more than the countless documentaries and books written about this conflict that is so simple and it reaches it, it 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 speaks in a way that everyone can understand and it's um and i should say it was uh, directed and animated and generally composed by nina pale with some help from others but um she really did do a fantastic job i'm assuming that's uh female name she's done a fantastic job that really really sums up just how stupid in some ways this conflict is and yet how so many different groups have seen that land as more than land so um i really recommend if you haven't seen it you check that video out there's a lot of rubbish gets viral this one deserves many many views um Okay, so that having been said, I, I want to talk about the nature of empires. Um, yesterday I was watching a documentary, a BBC documentary actually, um, and a Ghanaian British scholar was uh, talking about the great civilization of Great Zimbabwe and archaeological remnants for this. And he was focusing quite a lot on the historical Eurocentric view that um, such archaeological achievements couldn't have been achieved by Africans. They must have been constructed by Arabs or Europeans. Um, it was an interesting documentary and please have watched it. And the guy has a good voice for it. Um, he's got a calm, um, sort of academic voice. Uh, the only thing was it was a little bit the point he was making was kind of drummed in and it got, I felt it was a little bit politicised at points. Nevertheless, it was an interesting documentary. But it got me thinking about 
the entire nature of power, centralised power, hegemony and empire. Now, in case you haven't worked out, I'm British. And my country, at one point, not so long ago, was the global superpower. Without question, in the late 19th century, Britain was the absolute power. Um, the British Empire, in fact, was one of the three original superpowers, as coined by Winston Churchill, immediately after World War II. The other two were the United States and the Soviet Union. Um, the British Empire was the first to go, then the Soviet Union. The United States is arguably the only remaining superpower in the world today, though the Russian Federation and the People's Republic of China certainly are powers to be reckoned with. And then you get into the area of um, higher middle powers like Britain, modern Britain, France, Germany, Japan, India. Um, and then you get into middle powers. And uh, the this is actually a subject I find very interesting. The reason I don't make more videos about it is because I don't want people to get the wrong idea. I don't want them to think that I'm trying to shit stir, basically. And say this country is better than this country. This country is more powerful than that country. Um, I will be honest though. I, I am not one of these people that goes around apologising for my country's role in the world. I believe, as a Briton, my responsibility is to be honest, to recognise that we've done some unforgivable things, as every empire does. We were guilty of atrocities. We were guilty of cruelty and injustice and exploitation. These are all irrefutable points. But the other side of that is the positive influence that the British Empire had in the world, regardless of how that was attained, is irrefutable. The spread of communication, the spread of the Westminster style of government, the spread of railways, the spread of industrialisation, the list really does go on. So, when it comes to the British Empire, and I'm using this as a starting point because I think it's important, I certainly don't kind of uh, see it as we conquered the world, I'm proud, rule Britannia, but at the same time, am I entirely ashamed of it? No, I can't say that I am. It's hard to, if you have any sort of notion of fondness for your country, if your country has had a huge influence on the world, how can you not feel some pride? I don't understand that. Now, people may, might say it's jingoism or arrogance. I see it as quite natural. And in every powerful country, you find the same thing. There's many, many Americans are proud of American power. There's many Chinese are and were power, proud of Chinese power. And the list goes on. Really, the United Kingdom is no different. I don't think British people should be drummed into left-wing shame. I certainly don't believe we should be nationalistic and arrogant and pretend that we never done anything wrong, because we did. But I take the view that such a large empire that lasted over two centuries cannot simply be dismissed as evil. Certainly, to those at Amritsar it was evil, and to those at Croke Park in Dublin it was evil. But Britain in many ways was like Rome. And th this is something that I want to touch on. And it comes down to the nature of pretty much every empire. And I'm not going to give a long, long-winded history lesson, but I'm going to more or less outlay what would be considered the, the world's central powers over the this, let's say, to simplify things, 3,000 years, in fact, simplify things. If we consider civilization beginning with the Sumerians, or the Egyptians, let's argue the pharaoh-run Egypt was arguably a very strong system of government. It lasted three millenniums, longer than any other empire, including ancient Rome. So ancient Egypt, as the central power at that time, as the first really sophisticated civilization, and I'm putting it above Sumeria, simply because there have been new finds that suggest there is even older writing in Egypt than there was in Sumeria. Then we get further in time, the Greeks, the Romans are particularly interesting because Rome aggressively expanded and 
You know, today we always see the Romans as kind of arrogant warlords, and in some ways that's what they were. But I think there's a lot of parallels between Roman rule and British rule. Obviously there's differences. The British Empire didn't have bloody gladiatorial games. But it's not, it's not a coincidence that the British power was partly modelled on ancient Rome. If you look at Victorian art, if you look at Victorian, um, the Victorian style of government, um, viceroys and governors, um, in some ways, I think they saw themselves as almost like Roman consuls. And the British Empire got far, far bigger than even the peak of ancient Rome. In fact, the British Empire was the largest empire in history, by far. The second largest was the Mongol Empire, which I'll come to, and that was the largest contiguous, that is, in one continuous form. The British Empire was more scattered out, but it was the largest overall, estimated 36 million square kilometres at its peak. The Mongol Empire, about 33 million square kilometres. Um, so ancient Rome, the Romans genuinely saw themselves as a light in a dark world. Their notion of barbarians was brutal, savage, unsophisticated. What, what's important to remember is that whenever there is a counter to empire, there is always a moral argument for that counter, because empire by definition rules by force and by often cruelty. But very few empires, and certainly not the British and the Roman empires, ruled solely by force. If that was the case, they could never have lasted as long as they did, by military power alone. With empire comes a certain degree of intelligence. You don't get to be that powerful without knowing how to structure government, without knowing how to manipulate people, and without knowing how to be Machiavellian, frankly. So, to take Roman Britain, for instance, Brit Britannia was a province, there were a few bloody examples of uprisings against Roman rule, but what's forgotten today is most of Roman rule in Britain was peaceful. That's not to say the Romans weren't cruel, it's not to say that they weren't an occupying force, because they were. But most of that time was not marked by bloody Boudicca-style rebellions, it was marked by a kind of mutual understanding between the British tribes and Roman rule. And eventually that led to Romano-British people. It got so integrated that you ended up with a mixed bloodline. And that's where the Arthurian legends actually come from. This is also true uh, going a bit before Rome to Alexander's empire. One thing that Alexander done, which was arguably very clever, was integrating the lands that he conquered. So unlike Rome, he didn't just go in and impose his will. He was certainly a superb military tactician, but Alexander deliberately had his generals and his people marry the conquered land. So that is why, to this day, and I find this fascinating, if you look at some groups in northern Afghanistan, they have almost European features. There was a famous photo in the National Geographic a few years ago, showed a little girl. Now, if it hadn't been for the cover, and the information below it, you could be excused for thinking the little girl was Spanish, or Serbian, or Ukrainian, in other words, a European. Blonde hair, pretty light skin, blue eyes. She was an Afghan. And that comes directly from the influence Alexander the Great had in integrating the empires that he conquered. Um, again, you could argue the British art borrowed a lot of this sort of idea from from their conquered lands. I mean, it simply is not true that the British went in and killed all the natives and that was it. One thing the British done in India, they done many bad things in India, but one thing they did do was observe local customs. It's a misconception that the British just went in and forced British culture. Certainly there was some of that imposition there. But I'll give an example. The ancient Hindu custom of sati, that is burying the bride, uh, cremating the bride with um, with the husband when he died. The British certainly would have seen that as backward and primitive, but they didn't interfere. They they let that custom continue because they understood that in controlling such a large territory, 
full of Princeton skates. And this is another issue that has to be said. And some of my Indian viewers might not like this, but it's the truth. Pre-1857 India was not a united country, i.e. as an Indian nationalist country. It was full of competing princely skates, which the British largely controlled. Um, the Mughals, the Mughal Empire was fragmented when it ended. It was not a united empire. So when the British came in, it wasn't a case of the British versus the Indians because the Indians were not united. And some people might say this is British propaganda, but it is true. So the tag of the first Indian War of Independence referring to the 1857 events is misleading because India at that time was not united as a single political unit. It was a British colony. And again, I'm not saying that was morally justified, but I'm just saying that was the situation. Um, I keep coming back to the British because I think one reason the British Empire was so powerful and so large was precisely that. They borrowed concepts from all the other empires. I mean, if you look at the interest in classical antiquity that was prevalent in the Victorian era, pre-Raphaelite um, pre art, for instance, that says a lot. Uh, and that extended right across society. Um, so Rome eventually collapsed from civil war and um, weakened by that, by an Eastern Empire and by a Western Empire. Then we get into um, a period of people, conquerors who moved around, but didn't necessarily establish huge empires, but had a huge influence in the countries in which they landed in the Saxons in present day England, um, the Goths, the Vikings, all these groups had their influence. Um, then getting into the beginning of the last millennium, ancient China. Uh, well, uh, China is particularly fascinating because China is arguably the only country that has been a superpower on more than one occasion. With China, they were a superpower, at least in the East, during the Han Dynasty 2,000 years ago. Um, they didn't mix with the Roman world because neither world had discovered one another. A thousand years after that, at the height of the Tang Dynasty, I would argue that was another golden age for China. Um, obviously, the second, the last millennium was much more difficult. China was wracked by bloody internal rebellions, very bloody, in fact. Some of the bloodiest conflicts ever recorded in human history. Some equal to the scale of World War One in terms of mortality. And then eventually going through dynasty to dynasty. Each dynasty had some of their own strengths. But the reason the Qing dynasty today is so controversial in Chinese um, culture is because it was the last dynasty. And I think, I may be wrong about this, but I think the Chinese perception is they were the dynasty that, in a sense, betrayed China, that let China down. And of course, at that point, the great powers moved in and basically exploited a weakened Qing dynasty in the late 19th century. Um, so, as I've already pointed out, um, the European conflicts, I should maybe talk a little bit about the origins of the British Empire. There were, in fact, two British empires. There was the first British Empire, which isn't as well known, beginning roughly in Queen Elizabeth I's reign in the late 16th century. And that was relatively powerful, but I would argue at that time Spain was still the major power. And we were weakened by civil war, the wars of the three kingdoms. After the Act of Union in 1707, Britain wanted to forge a new national identity. In the 18th century, there was a series of very important conflicts, arguably global wars in their own right. The Seven Years' War, the War of the Austrian Succession, King George's War, Queen Anne's War. All these conflicts helped to forge uh, the European power structure. The real, real battle was between Britain and France, culminating in the Great French War, i.e the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars. France, of course, was very, very powerful at that point, And I would argue at the start of the 19th century, France was a superpower. But from roughly 1815 to 1914, i.e. from the British victory at Waterloo to the beginning of World War I, when our sources were greatly restrained and nationalist movements really began across the empire, Britain was the sole hegemony. 
There were other powerful countries, but Britain really was a superpower at that time, which is why sometimes the 19th century is called the British century. Um, and then we get into the 20th century. Both world wars had an enormous influence in this country, not only in casualties, but in, in expenditure. We simply could no longer afford to run an empire. During World War II, Mahatma Gandhi famously put the national struggle aside in order to help the Indian war effort. And to be fair to India, they really did um, play their part for the empire. In token of this, uh, Churchill had no choice but to relinquish and say, this land is yours. We will respect independence. Then, of course, came partition. That in itself is a very complex area, controversial area. 1950s and 1960s, decolonization, the empire eventually went. Arguably, the end of the British Empire was 1998, 1997 with the handover of Hong Kong. The beginning of the empire as we know it, arguably the Battle of Plassey, 1757, during the Seven Years' War. So 1757 to 1998, you could argue the British Empire lasted just over two centuries. Certainly shorter than some other empires, longer than others, and the most extensive in history. The Mongol Empire was um, the largest in history that was contiguous. And the Mongols ruled by sheer fear. But again, it would be misguided to assume that they ruled by brute force alone. I think that was a big part of Mongol rule, that they did rule by fear. You know, these distant warriors, much like the Hunnic Empire earlier, um, they almost won battles before they'd even occurred. And there's no question about it. Mongol rule was extremely bloody. Arguably, along with the Romans, the bloodiest empire in history. And I'm including the British in that. The British were certainly responsible, I would argue, for atrocities. Um, but the British ruled more by an arrogant sense of superior government rather than by military force. The British certainly had the capabilities to use military force when they had to, but it simply would have, wouldn't have been practical to always use that. In fact, after the Amritsar massacre, the general responsible for that was court-martialed. Now, arguably, he wasn't punished enough. But that indicates that the central government did not have a state policy brute force to put down rebellions. In fact, General O'Dwyer took it upon himself. He was eventually, perhaps in poetic justice, assassinated in London. Um, but, you know, I, I really believe that empire throughout history has similar trends. And this has only been scratching the surface. I'm sure I could talk about many other empires. I haven't touched on the Spanish empire which after the British was the largest European empire. There's been many, many empires in history, some not so big, some massive, like the British, the Mongols and the Romans, but, and the Archimedes Persian Empire, incidentally. But the point of this video, I don't want it to be misunderstood. It's not to say that empire is a good thing. It's fundamentally, it's hard to justify an ideology that is based on exploitation and taking and arrogantly saying we are right and that is it. So this video is not intended to be an apology for empire, but rather to point out that you, you cannot you cannot just say two hundred and fifty years is evil and that's it. Um if we look at contemporary times, let's get I'll just then round this up by getting a bit more contemporary. Like I said, after World War II, Britain was greatly weakened, so that was essentially the beginning of the end of the British Empire. The Cold War, of course, was defined by the might of the Soviet Union and the United States. The Cold War ended in 1991. Now, the reason Putin is arguably the most powerful man in the world is because he has been the individual who has tried to forge the return of a tandem superpower. Russia is a very powerful country. I don't think it's as powerful as the United States. I mean, its economy is way, way lower, and that is still a very important factor. Um, the United States at present remains the world superpower. But what I would say to my American viewers is you need to learn from all empires. All empires, all hegemonies come to an end at some point. America won't be the most powerful country in the world forever. Perhaps a long time. It could be 10 years. It could be the next 200 years. But at some point, American power will end. 
and I'm not saying I wanted to. I believe, given current choices, it's probably the best option for a superpower. That is versus China and Russia. But and I believe India is not quite ready to be a superpower. It, it has far too many endemic problems that the other three don't have. Um, and as for the European Union, well, that idea has definitely went out of the water with Brexit and the possibility of other countries slipping away. Um, so this is the nature of empire. Every empire is based on the notion, or every hegemony is based on the notion. I say hegemony because because empire has negative connotations today, and this is particularly the case with American power, there's a real reluctance among American uh, power scholars to talk about empire. But when you look at the nature, America, the American empire isn't based on colonies as such. But if you look at American military presence around the world, if you look at American influence around the world, and if you look at the sheer power of the American military, it is essentially an empire in everything but name. And that's, again, I'm not saying that's a good or a bad thing. It's just, it's just a fact. It's like the U.S. did have a small actual empire at one point under uh, Roosevelt after the Spanish-American War. It was short-lived, um, but it was a bit of an empire in the Philippines and in parts of the Caribbean. Um, but I would argue the United States today as a superpower, as the hegemony, is a sort of an empire. What's interesting is the film The Eagle, which was about um, set in Roman Britain, some people question why they had American actors playing the Romans. Actually, there was quite a clever reason for this. They had British actors playing the Brits. America today is a superpower. Now, the director said he wanted the Romans to have American accents to bring in a modern connotation, i.e. the United States is a superpower. What people need to understand about the nature of empires, all empires, they cannot be entirely brutal and cruel because if they were, they wouldn't survive because no oppressed people would tolerate for such a long time, no matter how much fear there is, it's human nature not to tolerate oppression. So with every empire, there had to be a degree of not necessarily compromise because it was never equal, but diplomacy, trade, and sometimes compromise. I mean, in Roman Britain, the Roman generals didn't always just go in and massacre the native Britons. There was a large degree of diplomacy going on. And this is one of the great strengths of ancient Rome in terms of intelligence. It was, you know, the Romans are often seen as arrogant and simply warmongers. They were actually pretty smart. You had to be to maintain an empire that long. So were the Egyptians. So was every empire. The British definitely were. And this is how it works. I mean, another feature of every empire is, of course, arrogance, is this notion that we and we alone are right, our ideology is right, and the rest of the world must follow. Now, a successful empire will have an influence whether people like it or not. The British Empire was arguably successful because its legacy is still widespread today. The English language, sports that were spread from this country, Westminster style of government, the list goes on. So that sort of central arrogance can be found in every empire. In ancient China, it was called the Middle Kingdom. They saw themselves as the centre of the universe. Rome saw itself as light in a dark world, and the British believed they were bringing civilization to um, distant lands. So that arrogance can be found in every empire. But there's also a degree of hypocrisy, because every empire presents itself as being more morally upright than previous empires. I mentioned the US, but if we take the other two contenders, let's say the People's Republic of China, the Communist Party loves to talk about anti-imperialism, and they love to talk about how the wicked Europeans exploit China. But Communist power is now being seen beyond the People's Republic of China. Under Xi Jinping, there's been aggressive nationalistic expansionism. We all know about those islands in the Pacific. I would argue Xi is trying to create a sort of modern Chinese empire. And it's described as soft power because the Chinese are reluctant to actually engage in military action. In fact, the last armed conflict China was directly involved in was uh, 
sign of the Vietnamese War of 1978, almost 40 years ago. That's perhaps where it differs from British and American power and why it's perceived to be soft power. But make no mistake about it, the communists are just as ruthless as any other type of hegemony. And if they had their way, they would absolutely expand across Asia. So, power basically hasn't changed since the dawn of time. The basic nature of power, I would argue, is pretty much the same. The exact nature of each empire varies. The culture of each empire varies. Some empires are perceived to be far more cruel than others. Every empire has blood on its hands. But fundamentally, that is true. Now, this has been a long video. I hadn't quite intended it to be this short, but there were a lot of issues to cover. So let me know your thoughts. Um, I would say one thing, though. Um, if you are if you're from a part of the world that was occupied, I can definitely understand your sentiments. But if I take India as an example, India aspires to be a superpower. Now, it would be very easy for Indian nationals to vilify the British Empire, but look at modern India since independence. It hasn't exactly behaved in an always morally upstanding way. If we look at Kashmir, if we look at other examples of certain actions the Indian army has undertaken, the point stands, every power will at some point use that power to force others to submit. Now, does that mean that military force is always used? Definitely not. I think one reason the American hegemony gets a lot of attention is because it is a present day hegemony, but also the Americans have been particularly keen on using military action, arguably more so than any other great power. And I'm not saying America's killed more than other people, it's not the same thing. You will find far more people died in dynastic China than the last 50 years of the United States. And sometimes people make sweeping statements that just isn't true. But the point I'm making is every power has its skeletons. No powerful country can honestly claim to be innocent. And where there isn't necessarily an outside aggression, you can be damn sure there will be internal oppression, as is the case with China. I think one reason that uh, Mao's crimes, and I might be going off subject here, but I think one reason that Mao's crimes still don't quite get the attention of Hitler's is because Mao, for the most part, didn't invade other countries. Certainly there was Tibet and uh, internal um, issues like that, but he didn't necessarily he didn't invade Japan or the Koreas or anything like that. But Mao arguably killed more people in peacetime than any other leader in world history in their own country. And that is a staggeringly bad prototype. The power of Mao is such that to this day he is still venerated in China, just 40 years after the events. So anyway, I'll close with that. What I would say to people is you cannot dismiss empire as entirely evil. Because every empire had to use diplomacy and had to use a certain degree of cooperation with people in order to survive. This is common sense. You cannot control a people without a certain degree of cooperation. And you could argue that cooperation was forced, but it simply wasn't the case. Very, very few empires, certainly not the British Empire, simply went in and killed all the natives and that was it. I mean, that wouldn't have been practical. They needed the natives. They knew their land. Um, I really recommend Neil Ferguson's book Empire about the British Empire. It's very, it's written in a very uh, in a way that's easy to read, but it's also very comprehensive. And it it doesn't gloss over British crimes, but nor does it go down the left wing line of all oh, the empire was evil and we must do the shit, which I don't agree with. You know, call me an apologist. I don't think I am. Okay, uh, I'll leave it there. This has been a very long video, but I think uh, it was all necessary to discuss. Thanks for watching.